dreams forevermore. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living, a casual look into the Word of God with the preaching ministry of Dr. Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ, located in Jones Valley in Huntsville. The Mayfair Church is a loving, Christ-centered church with a vision and a dream of sharing Jesus with the Tennessee Valley and the entire world. Every Sunday, Gary touches people's lives with the good news, and now he wants to share it with you one-on-one. So join us for the next few minutes as together we find the solutions to life's problems. Are you searching for those answers this morning? We believe the answers are there in God's Word, and that each of us can have the abundant life God wants to give us. He reigns for <clears throat> And now your host, Dr. Gary Bradley. Good morning and welcome to Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning, uh, Christmas weekend. And I hope today is uh, a very special day, just like yesterday was for so many families, for my family, and I hope for yours as well. You know, I, I've said so many times on uh, abundant living that I just am glad when anybody thinks about Jesus. And that's what we're talking about this morning. We're in Acts chapter 4. You might go ahead and get your Bibles and turn to Acts 4. In the next two weeks, uh, this week and next week, we're looking at Acts 4 and Acts 5 and Acts 6 because it's what happens to the church after she was established on the day of Pentecost. But before we do that, let me offer one more time power for today. And this is a free publication. It's a it's a, uh, 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 a a book that reminds you each day, uh, January, February, and March. It's a wonderful little reminder of a daily devotional. And I think you will admit with me that that's our problem, and that's uh, doing things on a regular basis in order for it to have the uh, effect that it needs to have. And so you begin in the morning. Just have this by your bed or by your table, drinking a cup of coffee, and then, and have your devotional. Or you can have it with your family. It gives you everything you need. It gives a scripture reading. It gives an illustration of what that scripture might mean to them. And then it gives a song, and then it gives a prayer. So this is just a priceless little publication. And I'm offering it one more time, free of charge, just simply uh, write or call, rather, area code 256-881-4651. And we will be more than happy to mail you your copy of Power for Today. And uh, I know it will be a blessing to you. Now, I want to make a very exciting announcement. And that is, uh, I got a call a couple of weeks ago, and I've had to just be quiet about it. Uh, until I can uh, announce it now, uh, beginning uh, January the 9th, just a couple of Sundays away, I will begin preaching as an interim preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Athens, Alabama. And I am certainly looking forward to being with them. I've met with some of the leaders already. Uh, Adam Brewer has been the preacher there, and he's done an outstanding job. They really do hate to see Alan and his family move, but he's moving to Jonesboro, Arkansas. And he will be there on Sunday and the ninth, the Sunday that I begin to preach, and there will be kind of a going-away party for him. And uh, I will begin preaching for them on a regular Sunday at uh, 9 o'clock every Sunday morning until they can find a new preacher, kind of like I did at Madison. You know, I was there for about five and a half months, and I thoroughly enjoyed being with those brethren every Sunday, and I will enjoy being with the Central Church in Athens, and I'm inviting all of my friends in Limestone County to come and and worship with us. We begin at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have worship first and then Sunday school. And so I hope you make you will make your plans to be with us, and uh, I'll get to meet you personally. That's the thing about, you know, I visit with you every Sunday, and like I was in a place, I was eating breakfast the other day, and a gentleman came up to me and spoke and said how much he appreciated Abundant Living and uh, what it meant to him spiritually, and I appreciate it so very much, because I don't know who's watching. 
you know, I talk to you about Cuba, and you respond so beautifully. And by the way, if you want to help out with the Kentucky, with the Mayfield, Kentucky disaster, uh, if you want to send a check to me, make it out to Mayfair and stub it, the uh, uh, tornado relief in uh, in Kentucky, then I will make sure that it gets to the right place. We have already sent some money, but there's going to be another collection real soon at Mayfair, and I'll let you know about that. But you can go ahead and give that if you'd like, because I will make sure, I promise you, it'll get to where it's needed the most. So let me hear from you from that if you uh, are... Uh, wanting to help out in some way. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 4 and 5 and 6. I'm, you know me, I'm going to start and we'll just, we'll just go as long as we can. But I want you to remember what happened. It was in Acts chapter 3 that Peter and John was going into the temple. And they saw this lame man. And uh, he did to them like he'd done to everybody else. He said, give me some money. Give, uh, please give me something, uh, some money so I can have some food, so I can take care of myself. And the man was over 40 years old, and so he obviously had been there a long time. And Peter made that very unique statement. He said, I don't have any money. Peter and gold have I none. Uh, silver and gold have I none. Uh, but what I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And so then that caused a blessing for him because he went with Peter and John into the temple and all around and attracted attention. And, and the leaders, the religious leaders of the day, uh, what they, they didn't care that the man could walk. What they were upset about was that it was in the name of Jesus Christ. He did something uh, Peter did something in the name of Jesus that nobody else could do, and that is make a lame man walk. And so then they were arrested, and uh, they were brought in. And let, let's go back and look just for a moment, because it's so, it's so needful today for us to have courage. And courage comes from conviction. Now, the Hebrew writer, chapter 5, and beginning in verse 12 on down through the end of that paragraph, he talks about the difference between babes and, and grown people. Now, there's a world of difference, isn't it, between babes? He said, I have many things to write unto you, but I can't because you're still a babe. You have need of milk. You have need of just the surface you're not ready to talk about courage and forgiveness and and uh, being pure in heart and 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 forgiveness. Those are heavy things that uh, Peter and John showed on this occasion. And so when he says that. Uh, I have many things to say unto you, but you're not ready to, to bear it. And so when we have conviction, and he said that you might be able to, I think verse 14, he says that through the exercise of use, you have discerned the difference between good and evil. Now, isn't that our problem? Isn't that our challenge every day to decide what's right and what's wrong? And how that concept has changed over the years, because I think we, I can remember when we used to know what was right and wrong, but now everything has gotten kind of in a gray area, that the idea is put forth that what is right and wrong is what's right and wrong for you. Instead of having an authority, instead of having someone in our life that's knows more than we do, someone who created us in his image. The Lord tells us what's right and wrong. The Lord tells us that uh, he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's in James, the fourth chapter. And so then uh, he, he said, and when they saw the courage of Peter and John, the courage to stand up to the Sanhedrin. Look, notice, let me go ahead and read it. And realizing that they were unschooled and ordinary men. 
they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I know I've been on this verse for a couple of weeks because I just can't leave it alone. We don't have enough people today that it can be said of them that they have been with Jesus. Uh, it's so interesting that the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians uh, 15.33, it says, evil companionship corrupts good morals. I can remember when mother used to be and dad used to be very, very particular about who I've been with. Who are your friends? Who are you running with? Who do you tend to be like in behavior and attitude? And so that's, that's very interesting that they said that they, first of all, they said they were ignorant and unlearned. Now that kind of, I looked that up and it kind of leaves the idea that they didn't have a skill. They didn't have a skill. They were fishermen. And then I would think that was a skill, but evidently they, the Sanhedrin didn't. And so they said that they didn't have a skill and they hadn't been to school. They hadn't been to the rabbinical school. They hadn't been taught like uh, evidently the Sanhedrin had. See, here's the opposite. Uh, and that's what happens so many times in the Bible. You have, you have the opposite of the situation. You have, you have the Sanhedrin that were 70 in number, and they sat in a semicircle. And those who were accused sat kind of in front of them, and all 70 of them were look, looked on these two men. And they're supposed to be kind of the Supreme Court. They're supposed to be the highest uh, position you can attain in the Jewish religion. The Romans allowed them to have the Sanhedrin. It was kind of a joke because the Romans were still in charge. And the Jews did not have the power of execution, only the Romans. And so that's the reason the Roman centurion was there when they crucified Jesus, to make sure that the Roman law was not violated. And so then you have, it's so funny that you have these men who think they're so smart, who think that they have attained uh, the scale of social status. But then here's some ignorant men in front of them. But then it gives them one of the best compliments in the Bible that they took knowledge. I wonder what all that included. Let me go back. I mentioned them a while ago. I think it included the, the courage that the Lord had to come and say what he did. You know, even his family didn't understand it. Even his family thought he had lost his mind, according to Mark chapter 3. And uh, so he had to have the courage. But courage comes from conviction. When you are convinced of what's right and wrong, when you are convinced that uh, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, uh, the Bible talks about this in John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for they that are in the tomb shall hear his voice. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Regardless of what man says, they are still right and wrong. We do still have some laws. And uh, uh, we have people, according to Romans 13, uh, these are, are ministers of the Lord because they enforce the law of the land. But now he goes on to say in Acts chapter 5, when they arrest him again, we must obey God rather than man. Now when it comes down to it, Christians back then didn't have any political power. They didn't have any influence at all. All they had to do was obey the law and pay taxes. And the Roman government received more taxes from Jerusalem than any other town. And so they were very concerned about how Jerusalem was carried on and, and what happened there and whether they uh, obeyed the laws of the land. And so we must obey the laws of the land until those low laws conflict with the law of Christ. Until they conflict this book. And I don't know what the future holds, and I don't know if we're going to have, I think there's more persecution 
with Christians now around the world than ever before. We hear reports about people. We just saw down in Haiti 14 people were held, were kidnapped for, I don't know, was it a month? And finally, finally, all of our prayers obviously were answered because those 14, including children, were released. Now, what were they down there for? To cause trouble? To overthrow the government? Uh, to abuse people? No, they were trying to teach people the Word of the Lord. They were trying to share with them what it means to be like Jesus. And the efforts that should be put forth each day to do the very best we can to have it said of us that people marvel, they are, they are just kind of blown away that we've been like the Lord. That there are similarities between our attitude and, and that, you find that, uh, that you find in the Lord. Not only did he have conviction, but he had purity of heart. Uh, he didn't have an agenda other than to get man right with God. Uh, in the book of John, he says, I came to do thy will, O God. See, God has always, from Genesis to Revelation, God has tried to draw man back to him ever since the fall. When Adam and Eve were driven from the garden, there was an angel with a flaming sword placed at the gate, lest they enter back in and eat of the tree of life. And so then man was separated from God. And because he was given his choice. God doesn't want robots. God wants people who voluntarily decide to follow him. And so then there's purity of heart. And that is when the Lord said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I know a lot of people that would come under this category, especially this time of year. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago that the holidays are not as uh, enjoyable to a lot of people as they are to some of us. And uh, it's difficult, and we ought to be, we ought to have a tender heart toward those that do not have the um, uh, frame of mind and the and the and the feeling that we have at this particular time when we're with our families, and uh, we'll, but we've all lost loved ones. We know how that feels, and it's extremely difficult at certain times in in life. So we need purity of heart. Jesus said, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." And we know what pure is. We know what pure water is. We know what pure air is. And so then, why don't we know what it means to have a pure heart? In Proverbs chapter 3, you've heard me quote this for years. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust. Lean not upon your own understanding, but in all of, your, in all of his ways, acknowledge him, and he will, uh, he will lead you forward. He will take care of you. He will direct your, sta your, your path. And so then that's what that means in chapter 4 when it says, and they, and they had took courage, uh, and they realized that they were... You know, some people believe that if you're a believer, if you believe the Scriptures, if you've obeyed the Lord, then uh, that's not... You know, I had a teacher years ago and I never will forget it because it was such a shock. I thought he was an educated man. He did have a Ph.D. in sociology. And um, I was taking this class because I needed it for my degree. And um, he said, you know, religion is good for old folks and babies. And I thought, my, what a terrible thing to say. Uh, not only did he say it, but he believed it. Because he thought he had gotten much more intelligent than the Lord, you know. He had figured the Lord out. He didn't need the Lord if he believed him if he believed in him at all. And then the the uh, uh let let's let's notice this as we uh look further. Then when they called them in again and and commanded them not to speak. Listen to this now. 
And I wonder if this is ever going to happen here in America. That is it possible? I know it is in other countries. I go to a country where it's not uh, permissible to speak or to teach in public in the name of the Lord. So uh, 90 miles off our coast. So it's not... There was a preacher years ago that traveled extensively around the country, and he said the time's going to come when Africa, especially South Africa, is going to send missionaries to the United States. I hope and pray that that never happens. I hope that it's not necessary that that happens. But we're moving very, very directly into a socialistic society. A society that doesn't need the Lord. And so he says, and when they called them in and commanded them not to speak or to teach uh, in the name of the Lord. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. We just can't be quiet about it. We've just got to tell it. And that's so characteristic of the early church. And as we're trying to be the church that you read in the New Testament, why can't we be like that? Uh, Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So whatever I'm excited about, whatever, I'm, whatever means the most to me is what I'm going to talk about. You cannot not tell your story. And your story, if your story is about the Lord and about what He's done for you and how He saved you and how He guides you and how He answers your prayer, then you can't help but tell it. And that's what Peter and John did. And look at verse 21. And further threatens, and for, and after further threaten, threatening them, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all of the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years of age. So what a predicament now that the Sanhedrin is in. Uh, they can't do anything to them. They just threatened them. They just said, uh, you know, don't you do that. I, you know, I don't think, and when I read this uh, yesterday and last night and again this morning, I, I don't remember ever being threatened. Uh, I, knew, I You know, I've been to Cuba 29 times. And not any of those times because I always abide by their rules. And uh, because if you don't, then you don't get to go back. And so that's the reason we've been able to keep the door open in Cuba is because we abide by their rules. And their rules are that it is a house church. There's no street. You can't stand on the street and preach. You can't go to the courthouse and preach like we used to years ago. You've got to be in a house and that's got to be with permission. You have to have permission to sing. You have to have permission to take communion. And then you have to have permission to baptize. And that takes a long time. Because there are people in the community who report to the government what's going on in their area. We've had stories where, well, I was preaching one Sunday in a little house church in Cuba, and two ladies got up and walked out. And uh, after worship was over, we got in the van, and I went down the street to Philip, my son, the preacher in Gunnersville, was down at the other end of the town, and he was preaching down there. And these two women were already there when we got there. And they said, we're going to report you to the government because you sang songs or praise without permission. 
The preacher knew that. The preacher got us in trouble in the sense that he got so excited about us being there and about the crowd that we had. They were standing around looking in the windows. And so he thought we, we might ought to sing. But he didn't realize that there were two women there who were from the government. And so that's, you know, that's the nearest thing. And that's nothing compared to what, because in Acts chapter 5, we'll look at it next week. In Acts chapter 5, they bring them in again because they won't hush. They, they accused them. They said, you have filled Jerusalem with all of your teaching. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could fill Huntsville with all of our teaching? Do you know half the people in Madison County don't go to church anywhere? Half the people is what I heard recently. And so then wouldn't it be wonderful if we could fill the town? And There's so many things said about these men because of their courage, because of their purity, because of their, their willingness to uh, forgive and their unselfishness. And that's the reason they were uh, picked out as being with the Lord. And so then uh, they went and uh, went on and the, they, couldn't, they couldn't do anything to them because they feared the people. And the fact the man was standing right there and he was over 40 years old. Now how did he get healed? Peter said Jesus did it. And the religious leader said, we're not going to stand for that. And so if you'll read chapter 5 with me, we'll notice next week uh, the fact that uh, even good churches, he kind of changed, Luke kind of changes gears here. He's letting us see the inside of the church. And the church started on Pentecost, had 3,000 members, but then went to 5,000 men. And so there's no telling how many are there now. But then a problem developed. A problem developed in the church that affected the whole church. So you read that and we'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. Until then, may God richly bless you and thank you for watching. This is our prayer. Until next week. Abundant Living, a ministry of the Mayfair Church of Christ. A place where children are loved, where families are strengthened, where teens learn to serve, and grandparents are special. Mayfair, truly a family place for all ages. The Mayfair Church of Christ, we're saving a special place for you. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Blessed be.